Cause it is time to bring in our guest for the hour, John Corzine, the former governor of and senator from New Jersey, as well as the former CEO of Goldman Sachs. Now, uh, Governor, let me ask you this question. I should first say thank you very much for joining us. Good Glad to have you. you. We've been talking a lot about Toyota this morning. As a former senator, I want to get your perspective on the hearings taking place. People might have been shocked to hear some of the things that Jim Lentz, the president of Toyota USA, said yesterday. Uh, but other people may say it's all kabuki theater, it's a kangaroo court. Really, what kind of perspective should we bring to this situation? Well, hearings are not uh, kangaroo courts, although they give uh, politicians the opportunity to, to frame questions from uh, a political advantage standpoint. Uh, there are people who come with very serious questions and there are others that are using it as a posturing uh, uh, position. I think when you have a serious issue like this, this is one of those ways that you can actually get information out. That's why I think it is uh, very good that uh, Mr. Toyota is actually coming and speaking himself and it's going to be a very challenging thing for a guy whose first language and, and comfort zone in speaking is not going to be in the language that he takes on or even understanding the question. So I, th I, I think as you heard yesterday there was uh, confidence, more confidence about some of the programming, even though that's the most complicated part to try to explain with regard to the, the technology. Um, it's important to get that information out. Public hearings do that, and I think it's good. But, but even though Toyota has said they don't understand even 70% of these sort of electronics issues, right. I mean, so it feels that sometimes like it's a, just a bit of blood sport to grab a president from a company and put him in front of Congress, well, especially if, where there's a language if, deficiency. If there is an uncertainty about how the programming in the car works, that's a good thing for the public to understand and also raises questions that people might ask other car companies. It's not just uh, Toyota that has complicated technology built into their yeah, 70 their system. chips I read go into most engines actually. You know I think the public gets the sense that all of us have blips that happen in our Blackberries, our PCs, our um, um, computers that we don't fully understand. There are a lot of complication built into our world today. There's a reason sometimes our windows don't go up and down in our cars, and it's not just Toyota. And so I think that raises a broader concern that can lead to greater discussion. That's a, that's a healthy thing, and actually probably will incent the auto companies to be more precise than they already are with regard to these issues. We were talking before the break about one of the events going on in D.C. today, and that is, of course, Toyota going before Congress. While we're on the D.C. subject, the federal deficit, I, I want to know if you think that Congress is as alarmed as it should be by the size of the deficit. Well, I think alarmed is something that I hear all the time from folks that are involved in the political world. Matter of fact, I'd move it towards hysteria as opposed to alarm in some instances. Uh, you know, there's a real debate about whether we put enough stimulus in fast enough, particularly fast enough, to uh, move the economy away from a jobless recovery. Um, you know, you can take the Paul Krugman argument and say that we were light short run and will cause longer term deficits. And I think that's a fair to debate for the people who are very concerned about it. If you don't deal with the long run drivers of deficits when the economy is growing, uh, our entitlement programs at Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, then you got a bigger, bigger reason to worry about deficits. And you know, I could translate that into states on pension funds and unfunded health care liabilities and other things. Oh, I think right. it is those issues that are a bigger problem than the, the point in time deficit, which really has to do with the underlying economic weakness. So the stimulus was a good idea. In yeah. my view, and my only uh, challenge to that is more of it should have been front loaded as opposed to we've only spent about a third, maybe 40% uh, of that, and I think a lot of it you could have argued maybe could have gone someplace else, but I think you needed a strong stimulus. And in fact, if we made a mistake, I think it wasn't big enough soon enough.
But, Governor, what investors want to know, particularly foreign investors, especially those who invest in treasuries and who hold U.S. dollar-denominated assets, is will Congress, will the House and the Senate be prepared to make the tough decisions down the road to get the budget back into balance and to deal with the national debt problem? It's maybe something that we don't need to think about now, but those people aren't worried about now. They're looking years out, right. and they want to know whether they can have confidence in Congress. Uh, I think the answer to that is people don't have confidence in Congress right now to take on those issues. There's not a great history of that. And probably the only time post-World War II that we saw any real attempt to do that on a serious basis were the, uh, the Clinton years where you saw uh, real changes. And it's going to take a bipartisan effort to get us into a mode where it is both revenues and cutting spending that is going to lead to those kinds of conclusions. Now, I personally have a little more confidence that people are not going to tolerate the kinds of deficits. I think the administration doesn't want those kinds of deficits that we see today continuing. And we're going to have to have real structural change. And it's, it's nasty business getting that done. It's but not popular when you talk about cutting back on Medicare or raising age limits and to, and matter of fact, you uh, become uh, unemployed as a politician when you talk about those. But put yourself in the shoes of an investor with that kind of intransigence in mind, knowing what to expect. Should we be bearish on treasuries? Should we be bearish on the dollar based on those prospects? I, I, I think the country has a history of when crisis comes that we have the ability to react and change. You know, the, it, it was shocking where we were in the early 90s relative to people's history with regard to deficits. We, we and on a bipartisan basis, took action. I think the beginnings of that consensus are working their way in Congress right now. That was why it was so important, this debt commission that the president's been talking about and is in the process of appointing. It would have been better if it was Congress working together. I think that was political that they moved back from that. People who sponsored it then didn't go forward. But I think we'll get to that. And there will be uh, a consensus that we can't be running trillion dollar plus deficits as far as the eye can see. It's not going to happen. And change will happen. Just a few moments ago, we were talking to you about the federal debt problems and what we need to do on that front. But one thing the feds can do is push off their liabilities into the future. State and local governments, for the most part, aren't so lucky. They've had to make some very difficult decisions. Colorado Springs, I'm not sure if you know this story, turning off the lights. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, nearing bankruptcy. The situation in Jefferson County, Alabama. Does the public really appreciate how serious the Muni debt crisis is right now? Uh, I doubt they do. Um, the uh, public generally looks at states and local governments being able to act like the federal government, and almost all of the states have, at least on a cash basis, a requirement to balance money in and money out. And uh, they have to have balanced budgets on that basis. Now, the reality is, is that a lot of the states, over a long period of time, have used uh, different methods to match their cash flow, but not necessarily the real dollars in and real dollars out, haven't put money into pension systems. And I'll admit, we didn't put all of the money in that we should have done uh, in New Jersey when I was governor. Not because we didn't want to, but we had to meet the constitutional responsibility of matching dollars in versus what your budgets are. And that is a much more serious problem at our municipal levels than it is actually at our states. Governor, you, you said yourself, not to cut you off, governing is messy. Getting elected governing is easy, is, but maybe not easy, but uh, easier anyway than governing. Um, how do you decide whether to cut headcount or whether to cut benefits? Uh, I mean, as you alluded to, the, the muni crisis is certainly looming. Is the answer cutting heads? Well, you're going to have to do all of the above. Um, there are no uh, easy choices when you have to meet those obligations um, and you have a constitutional responsibility. Uh, Headcount, furloughs, uh, different kind cuts in absolute wages, uh, givebacks in wages, pension benefits. Uh, you're going to have to cut programs. Some of the things that people find most valuable. Uh, we we um, we did that. 
Uh, in my four years, it didn't make you all that popular. The new governor in New Jersey is taking even stronger steps to cut. Um, you know, I might disagree about the specifics, but it has to be done, and it's going to be done in every state. And when you go through these kinds of recessionary times that we have had now going on for two years, states bear an incredible brunt of this, and it actually has major implications for the macroeconomy as well. We're so glad you're with us here in the studio, Governor, to talk about, among other things, Goldman Sachs. This is quickly becoming the most vilified financial brand in history. Why? Well, when you're successful, it brings envy and all of those other things that are fairly human. And then when you make an occasional mistake in public... Like Lloyd uh, Blankfein saying he's well, doing God's work? Or? You know, you know, it is easy to misphrase something at the right, wrong time when maybe you thought you were tongue was in cheek. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't look back on someone and say, I never made a mistake myself in verbalizing something. But um, those kinds of things at a time when people are extremely sensitive is extraordinary. And the other issue is, is that uh, people are broadly frustrated with the financial So Goldman incident, has become a scapegoat. Since it is the leader of the industry and has had shown great success over a long period of time, I think it's more vulnerable. Uh, Governor, you mentioned just a moment ago that Goldman made the occasional mistake. You know the firm, maybe not as well as anybody there today, but over the course of its history, you know it as well as anybody. What did Goldman do wrong in your estimation? Well, I, you know, I heard uh, one of their leading managing directors say that they should have brought more transparency to the uh, currency swaps that were associated with Greece. I think there was, a, there, there always is a tendency to be less transparent, uh, and certainly after the fact, that's easy to say um, about some of the th activities that a financial services firm might be involved in, um, and there are always the issues of how you explain. We were just talking about the Toyota press release and the gentleman from the, the firm talked about how uh, mixing up quality and volume uh, ahead of safety could be a threat. Those kinds of mistakes end up having long-term implications. They get repeated over and over again, and I think Goldman has suffered from some of that. But did Goldman do something like that, which is to say abandon the ethos that made it different from every other Wall Street firm, which is to say focus on long-term greed and not short-term greed? I think Goldman still has that ethos. I think that there is still a strong ethos of commitment to client. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not there every day, but there was a clear uh, uh, commitment to success to the bottom line as well, which is shareholder value, which is what people who lead public companies are about. Uh, so I think that uh, um, if you, there was an ideal of what Goldman Sachs might have been in a different era, um, as it's gone into a public company, I think that the drivers got more equalized did, in those terms. Did Blankfein let the traders take over? No. Lloyd, in my view, has done a much better job than some of the publicity surrounding it. You know, this was a, an incredibly challenging time for any institution, financial institution. And that institutions gotten through this better than most, held the team together better than most, and has continued to serve clients better than most. But at what point, and maybe we're there, does all this bad PR, you'd have to say, begin to hurt Goldman's business? And you'd have to figure that's the biggest concern to Lloyd and the shareholders. Of course they're going to be worried about it, but on the other hand, the best thing to do is kind of what the uh, PR consultant said, speak a little less, do a lot to serve your clients and your shareholders. And I think uh, sticking to the knitting of the fundamentals of what your business is about is the way to try to meet uh, those kinds of challenges that come from uh, the, the public uh, attack on the brand. Uh, Governor, we were talking about Goldman Sachs just before this last break, and I want to continue with a couple more questions. The question of cultural change and whether or not, as Deirdre asked, uh, Lloyd Blankfein let the traders take over, in your mind, would the Goldman of today put a Hank Paulson in charge of the firm? I think 
it's very likely that in due course you'll see people coming out of the investment banking world leading Goldman Sachs. I think that uh, uh, this is this is an issue that's gone on as long as I've followed the firm. We've had traders, Bob Rubin and Steve Friedman who was Gus a banker, Levy. Gus Levy, and I, I think this is uh, describing because it's interesting to describe it as traders row. But you know, trading and leverage are going to be less parts of financial institutions uh, as we go forward. Certainly not going to be eliminated, but you know they're not going to carry the same balance sheet. The uh, uh, the merger business is still going to be an important element, giving uh, fundamental advice uh, on a corporate finance level. Very important. I think Goldman Sachs will see people come from various areas. Money management may be the, uh, the side of the firm that generates a leader of the firm in the future. Eric mentioned Paulson. I'm wondering if you think he's become a cautionary tale. I mean, there's many big Goldman alum names, yourselves included, that have gone into public service after the hassle of the financial crisis, do you think Wall Street execs are going to want to serve publicly? Well, I think people need to understand when they walk into the public square, uh, it is, it's open season on uh, how people it will review. It's a different environment. It's a different environment than the privacy of, uh, of being a CEO or to be uh, in the private sector. But I think Goldman's ethos and I think other places will still be able to draw on folks who understand that the reason they've been able to be successful is we operate in a broad environment and in, in an environment that is built because our country works, because our high public institutions need to be better and stronger and so you have to participate. I don't I don't think that's going to change. I don't think it's going to change at Goldman. I don't think it's going to change um, generally and we see a bunch of CEOs running for uh, public office this year uh, around the country. Meg Whitman and uh, others. I think it's very clear that people who sense that they've benefited because we have a system that works need to give back and to participate in it. Governor, how has your view of Wall Street changed by virtue of your service uh, for the public? It, you know, are you more inclined now, say, to think that we should tax banks? Are you more inclined to support Paul Volcker in his efforts to eliminate prop trading? Well, I, I'm not uh, generally in favor of the Volcker rule. Um, I think that uh, it, you're just going to create those same kinds of risks in other institutions that don't fall subject to it. So I don't think, I'm not sure it's going to accomplish what the good intentions of it are. On the other hand, and I'll turn off a few of your listeners, I do believe that the system tax, uh, the bank tax that's being talked about makes sense. It's, it's like the FDIC uh, insurance policy. And you know, we're looking back first to pay for what was necessary to get us through the systemic crisis, but there should be a buildup. It probably should be broader, uh, more broadly just, applied than just too big to fail institutions. But right now, it's just a cash grab. It's, they're not actually funding a systemic risk insurer. The bank tax well, proposed by the government is just a revenue collection well, scheme. Of a reflection of the historic use of the taxpayers' dollars to keep the system afloat that has allowed some of those institutions, some whom didn't even want the TARP money, to be able to be successful as we go forward. And I don't think that's wrong, and I think it would be better to set up a pool of funds ahead of time that allowed the government to be able to deal with crises, which is, by my read of history, will happen again just a matter of whether it's as serious or in one form or another. I've seen all this for the 35, 40 years I've been mucking around in the financial services world. We can't let you go, Governor, without asking, what's next for you? You mean when I get off the unemployment line? I was going to yeah. say, when you get out of the newsroom, yeah, where right. do you go? Well, I'm looking at three or four different kinds of options, um, working with people and in financial institutions that uh, I think I can make a contribution uh, of so as perspective. A consultant. consultant, advisor, you know, a gray hair. I wish I had some hair. But the uh, 
the 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 interesting ideas that also examining is whether there is room for an institution that's not too big to fail, that's too little to hit the screen and grow into the financial services as you go forward. So we'll examine uh, some so derivative of those options. Op no, no, I, 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 I said on. what I, we will look at all of those options. Do you have any appetite to return as the CEO of a major financial services firm at any point in the future? Well, it better happen fast since I'm getting a little older as the clock turns. But um, I would look at each individual situation. Uh, there are turnaround situations that I think are exciting for uh, building uh, a franchise and a brand. Like, like John Thane at CIT, yeah, for I example? Think that's, uh, that, that is a great opportunity for uh, Mr. Thane, and those kinds of things may uh, provide an avenue of exploration at some point. Are there any wounded animals you see out there that you're going to play uh, vet to? You know, I, I'm just getting reacquainted with this world. I'll, I, I, I'm, I'm ducking and diving here. I wouldn't, if I had an idea about where you'd go, I wouldn't wouldn't say today but the the fact is is that I think there are opportunities uh, as there is a restructuring deleveraging recapitalization of financial institutions of of uh, organizations to at least look whether you could build a franchise and a brand building something for the long term is an exciting uh, proposition People wonder if you were asked to talk to Bank of America, for example, if you were ever considered for the job, did that come up? Or have you been asked and since turned down any opportunities with other firms? No is the answer to uh, the Bank of America um, situation. Um, never had any conversation. Would have been a little awkward because the state of New Jersey does a lot of business with Bank of America. And when they were going through that process, I was the governor and I would have had trouble even allowing myself on a conflict basis to enter into those. Would you say you're, you're, it seems though that you're clearly making a turn away from public service? Well, I'm going to keep a, I'm going to keep a foot in that area, whether it is through teaching um, some of the think tanks that, that are involved. I'm sure that I will speak up. I, I feel I mean, we had this discussion that we got sort of down the pike on, on, on debt whether it's at the federal level or state level. I think there's a lot of perspectives that come from the experiences I have. I think it would be a mistake not to talk or write about them. I'm going to have to ask you for a one-word question because we're running out of time. If uh, one would answer, if you looked at the world right now, put yourself in the position of somebody with capital, where would you be putting your money? What's the best investment that you see out there? I'd be in biotech some of the areas where I think the exploration of the genome and applications are going, and financial services, since I know something about it. All right. Well, Governor, so much. former governor of New Jersey.